my life is very busy. Yeah. I don't sleep enough. I drink yeah. too much coffee, yeah. <laughs> but that's because I just can't get everything done by myself. to be with you. Thank you. We so appreciate your coming to my kitchen to <laughs> hear my family's story. Thank you for having the courage to tell your story. Because with everything that you have going on, meaning all of the responsibilities and the burdens that you carry, that you are being this generous to share this time with us and tell the story is going to have an impact on so many people that you may never meet. There's a lot going on at once. I'm overwhelmed. I'm stressed. I'm struggling. But I'm also very hopeful. My daughter, Claire, was born 15 years ago with complex medical needs mm -hmm. and multiple disabilities, right. even with two pretty good salaries. Right. We just could not find reliable or affordable care for her. So I had to leave the workforce. I had to leave my entire career. And then shortly after Claire was born, my parents both became ill. And so I had to step in and take some caregiving responsibilities for them. Yeah. And that's pretty common in my generation and yeah. the sandwich generation where we're torn between taking care of our children yeah. and elderly parents. Yeah. And work and care are so intertwined that without the care, it was impossible for me to work. Mm -hmm. And because of the pandemic, we've really seen that millions of women in a similar position to me have had to leave the workforce. Almost 2 million. Almost 2 million. That's a lot of women. Yeah. That's a big loss to the economy. Yeah. And the primary reason is because of lack of dependable, affordable care. Yeah. Yeah. And the Build Back Better agenda does address that problem if it has full funding. And when we talk about this issue, there are at least 8 million, some estimates as many 60 million people in America who are raising their children while taking care of their parents. The physical demands, the emotional demands, the financial demands are immense. Um, I'd like you to, to explain almost a day in the life of Jamie. A typical day is waking up early around six o'clock, trying to get everybody ready for school, taking care of breakfast, packing the backpacks. Um, and Claire, of course, has a lot of additional needs. And this is something that will persist lifelong. And she brings me a lot of joy, but it, it is difficult on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, once the kids are at school, um, I do spend a lot of that time still engaging in caregiving yeah. for them. Um, fighting with insurance companies yeah. takes up a lot of time. <laughs> and then on top of that, I am also trying to make sure my parents are taken care of. Um, they do live in a different state, which is very difficult. I think that um, there's a component of this that you are living, that people in this position are living, that needs to be better understood, which is also the unpredictability of each one of your days because you never know i when. never know and so you're constantly alert and aware if not experiencing an emotional intensity around also not knowing what might come next at any moment unpredictably it makes it impossible for me to even think about going back to full-time work in a serious way and a part of that is also not having access still on a reliable basis to home and community-based services. And Claire right now, we're lucky we have a great caregiver who's wonderful, but there are a couple of things that make that not sustainable. Um, one is that she's been working 15 hour days throughout the pandemic, seven wow. days a week, because Claire needs, she needs one-to-one -one supervision at all times. So caregiver burnout for me as yeah. her mother is, is yeah. very real, but also for the help we have. Yeah. Not to mention paid leave and paid sick leave. And so I am worried that they are going to come into my house yeah. sick. And I understand they need to get paid, but Claire is immunocompromised. Right. Right. That could put her health at risk. It's not safe right. for her. These are some of the things that, um, that are just absolute necessities to function and live for everyday people, like real people. Yes. As opposed to theoretical people, like real people need what we call the infrastructure to allow you to get where you need to go. That's how I define infrastructure, by the way. What do you need to get where you need to go? 
And sometimes you just need to go to sleep. <laughs> exactly. Right. And so it's not it's not just paid sick leave. No. They need paid they need, time off for they need any time reason. time off and family leave, but also we should pay them their value as a system. And, you know, when it when we're talking about elder care, I mean, this is one thing that the president cares very deeply about. He and I both, and, you know, I took care of my mom when she had cancer. And um, you want to make sure that we are allowing people also, especially at that stage of life, to live at home because that's really where they want to live. And let's figure out how we can create a system that allows them to then have the facilities within where they live to be able to do that. And that gives them the sense of well-being and dignity that they deserve. And nobody should have to have a quality of life where you have taken on the responsibility to be a parent and to be a daughter. A society should applaud that and support that because it is in the best interest and the well-being of, of society that we support that. Thank you for saying Indeed. that. And it also is about what we need to do to assist um, parents with children with disabilities. Claire has a great life. And I do feel like a lot of people look at her and think, well, she's nonverbal, she uses a wheelchair. So why should we invest in her care? So she is a happy, I almost said little girl. She's a teenager now. Yeah, she is a happy, <laughs> yeah, she's a happy young woman. Yeah. Um, there, yeah. She loves ice cream and she loves swimming and she loves Disney movies and spending time with her siblings. And she's not a vegetable that we can just forget about. We need the home and community-based supports to yeah. be able to function as a family. My younger kids, three younger kids, um, have some needs that weren't being met by our current school district. And so we looked into moving to Maryland, but what we found out was that there would be about a seven to 10 year wait list for Claire to access the programs that they have. It's a huge issue, which is not it, that, that we actually, the supply is not meeting the demand. And part of the supply is about whether or not we're putting the resources in, in terms of the adequate support so that people are entering the caregiving profession. That's a big part of how we're thinking about the Build Back Better approach, which is it's the whole cycle, right? So it's the family and then what supports the family caregivers. And then what are we doing to invest in their well-being and their skills and their and their ability to, to feed their own families? Right. right? Absolutely. Because that's the whole cycle. And it's an interesting thing also about women in the workforce. So my mother, she worked long hours, long days. And so we had a what we call our second mother, who basically that's where we would go, Miss Shelton. That's where we would go. And my mother would always say she could not have done anything that she did without Miss Shelton. Well, Miss Shelton ran a, a nursery school and a daycare center. What I realized is that when we're talking about people who are in the caregiving profession, it's mostly women. And they are sometimes small business owners supporting women who want to go to work. <laughs> and so there's a whole ecosystem if you think about it in that regard. I've for a long time worked with like home health care workers and caregivers. They are the angels walking among us. And so that's why part of the Build Back, Back Better program is about all that we need to do to put the resources into the caregiving economy and support them. The work that we are doing that is about taking care of our elderly relatives, our parents. Well, the cost, by the way, of helping them stay in their home with them feeling a sense of, 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 of strength about the dignity of being able to be where they want to be. Well, there's the psychic cost, which is the benefit to all of us of that. But there is also, we save money. Absolutely. By not requiring them to go into some other facility. We save money in the process of giving people dignity. Well, that's a win-win for everybody. And that's true for children with disabilities. And absolutely too. right. And so the, my philosophy is that we are always a better and a stronger society when we are raising happy children who are loved in every way and nurtured in every way. I feel very strongly about that. All of society benefits. All of society benefits. Definitely. I couldn't agree more. So we can't do it alone. No. No. I feel like I could talk to you all day. You are amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Well, I want to thank you, Jamie, for inviting us to have this conversation and for the courage of, of, of your story and your ability to tell it. Thank you. We so appreciate your coming and taking the time to hear my family's story. It really shows your commitment to women and people with disabilities, children and seniors. And it's just so refreshing to have this hope that we can build back better. 